By the time I went to stay with him, John Fung very rarely accepted meals outside of the monastery. And when he did, he asked that he not be asked to chant. He said he'd be happy to discuss the Dharma, but he didn't want to give house blessings. That was for us younger monks. And there was one time one of his students invited him to her home, and the student's sister had been meditating with another teacher, had some meditation questions. And she started out by saying, the whole purpose of meditation is to make your mind empty, right? And John Fung said, no. If you leave your mind empty, it's like leaving the door to your home open. Anything can come in. We've all noticed this. You try to settle down with the breath and be quiet, and all of a sudden thoughts of the past, thoughts of the future, things you regret about the past, things you were worried about in the future come barging in. So simply doing the concentration is often not enough to keep them at bay. Sometimes you can just tell yourself, I'm not going to go there. One good trick is as soon as a thought comes in and starts speaking to you, just refuse to understand the language. Try to cut the connections between the words and the mind so it becomes gibberish, kind of scrambling the signal. But there are other times when you have to develop the right attitude. The Buddha didn't teach just a meditation technique. He taught attitudes to go along with training the mind, reasons for training the mind, ways to think so that unskillful thoughts don't come in and take over. So in this way you're not leaving the mind empty, you're giving it work to do. And one important thing is to think about the principle of karma. And also just the immensity of rebirth. We think about things in this lifetime that we regret. And the Buddha has you cast your mind away from the present moment for the time being. It's just think about how far back into the past we've been trying to find happiness, struggling along, dying, or being reborn again, struggling some more, dying, re being reborn again. And the whole process is run by craving and clinging. Now, clinging is a word in Pali, Upadana, that can also mean feeding. We're feeding off of one another. And so this is endless process of feeding, 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 and then getting a little bit of satisfaction and then not having any satisfaction anymore, having to feed, having to feed some more. Just think about how long this has been going on and how many stupid things you've done in the course of that time. And they become so many that they become meaningless. And that's the whole point. You want to make it meaningless so it doesn't have a huge impact on the mind. And then you come back to the present. See, here I am doing something good with my time right now. Because this is the spot where you can be responsible. You're not responsible for going back and changing things in the past. As the Buddha said, no matter how much you regret what you've done in the past, you can't go back and change it. But you can make up your mind right now that if you recognize that you've made mistakes, just tell yourself, I don't want to make that mistake again. That's the most that can be asked of a human being. We're not expected to be perfect as we come here. The Buddha doesn't say that you have to have your virtue perfect before you can sit down and meditate. We're all coming from ignorance. We're all coming from a lot of wrong ideas in the past. Now we're trying to straighten them out. And that's the whole point, is we can straighten them out. As the Buddha said, if we couldn't abandon unskillful qualities, unskillful actions, he wouldn't have taught it. If we couldn't develop skillful ones in the place, he wouldn't have taught us to do that either. But it's because we can make these changes. That's why we're practicing. That's why he taught. And then try to have goodwill. Goodwill is your protection for the future, in the sense that the things you really regret most are when you did something out of ill will, out of a desire, desire to harm, and then the harm came. 
And then it suddenly hits you that you really shouldn't have done that. That's the kind of regret that hurts the most. The mistakes you make out of goodwill are a lot easier to deal with. You just didn't know. You were ignorant, but there was nothing wrong with your intention in the sense of being a bad intention. And that kind of mistake is a lot easier to live with. That's why the Buddha encouraged his son, and before you act, ask yourself, is it going to harm anybody? If you see that it's going to harm somebody, you just don't do it. While you're doing it, you check. Is there any unexpected harm coming up? If there is, you stop. Because you have to remember the principle of karma. Some actions take a while to show the results, and other actions show the results immediately. And in fact, they actually shape the present moment. So if you see any harm coming up, you have the ability to stop. If you don't see any harm, you keep on doing it. When you're done, then you look at the long-term results. And if you see that there was harm done, then you can talk it over with somebody. Get some advice from someone who's more advanced on the path. And learn how not to be too ashamed to admit your mistakes. Because if you can't admit your mistakes to other people, after all, you start putting yourself in a position where you can't admit them to yourself. And then you can't learn. So there's this, that old principle of how to learn from your mistakes, this is how you do it. So the mistakes don't leave too big a scar. As I said, you start out with the intention not to harm. And that protects you from having to deal with a lot of really bad regret on into the future. And sometimes, of course, as the mind gets open and relaxed in the present moment, thoughts of the future come in, things you're worried about. And you have to remind yourself, you don't really know what's going to happen. But you do know that you're here right now. And the best way you can prepare for unknowns is to develop as much mindfulness and alertness and discernment as you can. And that's what you're doing. So the best way to prepare for the future, the best way to deal with thoughts that come up and say, how is this going to be? How is that going to be? I don't know if I can handle this. Just remind yourself, if I'm more mindful and alert, I'll be able to deal with situations as they arise. Because there are always going to be unexpected things, so this is how you prepare for the unexpected. So in both cases, you're thinking about the past and thinking about the future. If you think about them in the right way, it pulls you back to the present moment to develop the qualities you know you're going to need. So you don't have to repeat your past mistakes and that you'll be ready for unexpected things as they come. So as you meditate, it's not just a matter of emptying the mind in the present moment. You give it work to do. You've got to change your attitudes. You can't just tell the mind, okay, just do this technique and it'll be okay. You have to have the right understanding behind it. This is why the Buddha put right view at the beginning of the path. Of course, there are ways in which he describes the progress along the path in which discernment comes last. But a certain amount of discernment, a certain amount of understanding has to be there at the beginning. You start with right view. It's not right knowledge. It's not going to be knowledge until the end of the path. But you tell yourself, these are the opinions I need to work on. These are the opinions I need to adopt as my working hypotheses. And then you have to keep teaching the mind those opinions, because it has a lot of old, unskillful opinions still sloshing around inside. So you can't just hope that a technique of noting or a technique of whatever is going to take care of all those problems. There's a right understanding that has to go with this. To motivate you to practice and to keep your practice on course. And also to deal with the distractions that come up, no matter which direction they pull you, to the past or the future. Sometimes you have to give them a little, little slack. In other words, think about the past, but think about it in a way that's going to bring you back to the present moment. The same way with the future. Think about it, the future a little bit, and then remind yourself, okay, the best preparation for the future is to meditate. And then as for the thoughts that come up then, 
learn how to chop them up. As you breathe in, think of it scattering the thoughts. Or you can think of the breath as being like a big broom, sweeping through the body, sweeping through the mind, sweeping those thoughts away. Students can settle down and actually strengthen the mind here in the present moment. So it has the strength to maintain those right views, maintain the right perspective. It's in this way that discernment and concentration go together. They help each other along. I'll often hear the question, how much concentration do I need before I can practice insight? And the two have to go together. The Buddha never taught them as totally separate practices. He says, ideally, they should go together, insight and concentration. The insight develops the concentration, your concentration develops your insight. But remember that you need both. So the concentration can strengthen the insight, the insight can help protect the concentration. It's when the path has all its factors that it can really do its work. <laughs>